Legend tells us that the people of Mongolia came from heaven, from the blue sky. And when in the 13th century, Ogadai Khan, successor to his father, the great Genghis Khan, wanted a religion for his empire, he gathered together all the leaders of the religions at that time. There were practitioners of the old shamanist beliefs, the Pope's envoys from Christian Rome, advocates of the Quran and the Muslim tradition, and many more. And also lamas came to reveal the spirituality of Buddhism. Agadai told them to hold a debate about their teachings. As a result of this, the Emperor of the Sons of Heaven decided that the Buddhist teachings were the most true. He then proclaimed Buddhism as the state religion of Mongolia. This was the beginning of a deep and rich relationship between Mongolians and Buddhism, a tradition that has crossed centuries to shape the Mongolian soul, a culture that is being revived under the blue sky of the present day. Welcome to Ulaanbaatar, capital of the modern Mongolia. Here new buildings are rising above shanty towns, traffic jams are blocking the streets, and traditional outfits are stepping aside for Western fashion, adopted by the young generation. Mongolia is a country of youth. Over 60% or around 70% of the Mongolian population are children and youths under 30 years of age. Therefore, it has been accepted worldwide that Mongolia is a growing country. Ulaanbaatar is the center of a young democracy in a country six times larger than the United Kingdom situated between two giants, China and Russia. With a population of less than three million people, Mongolia is the least densely populated nation in the world. Endless steppes, mountains in the north and the west, the Gobi Desert in the south, Mongolia has always been a land populated by horses, livestock and nomads. On the other hand, Mongolia is also changing from a nomadic culture to a settled civilization. Almost one million people live in Ulaanbaatar out of a total population of 2.5 million. Because of this, the nomadic and settled communities are getting mixed up into one pot. To merge together requires a certain amount of time. Someone described Mongolians to me as very brave people. I think they are very brave. They embraced the changes in democratic times. They had a terrible time in the 90s with appalling inflation, with increase in poverty, with experimentation by the great free market institutions um, who were forcing a system onto Mongolia or, or yeah, it, forcing, I would say, a system onto Mongolia into a nomadic society. This transition period began with the democratic revolution in 1990 after 70 years of communist rule. One has to remember that just 20 years ago, these streets were under the surveillance of the Soviet army. Buddhism, the foundation of Mongolia's culture and tradition, had been systematically repressed by the Soviets, 
and a large part of Mongolia's heritage destroyed. It was the kind of catastrophe that can lead to the loss of a culture's memory. But the story of Buddhism was so deeply anchored within Mongolia that it couldn't be forgotten. Buddhism began in India around the 5th century BC with the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, known as the historical Buddha. In short, Buddhist core teaching is how to purify the mind and to attain enlightenment. Buddhism is a great teaching as it shows people how to prevent and overcome their own negative deeds that are a result of an unclear and undisciplined mind and how to transform their own bad habits as well as false perceptions. At the present day, there are broadly speaking three distinct forms, three vehicles of Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism, found in South Asia, Sri Lanka, Thailand and Burma, Mahayana Buddhism in East Asia, China, Korea, Japan, and finally Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, Mongolia and Russia. Buddhism was disseminated three times in Mongolia. The first period of dissemination was considered to be during the Hanu times when other ancient tribes existed in the land of Mongolia. The middle period was after Chinggis Khan's time when Tibetan Buddhism spread widely with the coming of monks from the Sakya and Kagyu traditions from Tibet. The last dissemination began from the third Dalai Lama of Tibet, so in this way it's one religion. Before 1937, there was only the Buddhist religion. Therefore, everybody was very religious. All had sincere faith in Buddhism, as there was no other religion. Everybody strictly followed religious rituals and ceremonies. Now, after 70 years of communism, Mongolian Buddhist monks can walk freely again on the streets of Ulaanbaatar. They're the leading force in the revival of Tibetan Buddhism in Mongolia. Mongolian lamas are either very old or very young, because there was a big gap when there was no religion at all for 70 years. We can say that the restoration of Buddhism started in Mongolia in 1990. It's only now that Buddhism is finding its way to develop in Mongolia. Therefore, now is the time to solve many problems. Among the Buddhist challenges, there are new religions coming from the West. In particular, evangelical churches from the USA or South Korea are expanding in the poor areas of Mongolian towns. In 1999, one in nine people in Mongolia were followers of foreign religions, which became one in five in 2005. This number is increasing day by day, which means the younger generation will follow foreign religions, ignoring us. I hope our Buddhist organizations will take action very soon regarding this because we can't sit and wait until something happens. But the main issue faced by Buddhism in Mongolia has been access to Buddhist education. Most of the great Mongolian scholars and high lamas died during the communist time without being able to pass on their knowledge. Also, Mongolian Buddhist rituals and most of the sacred texts are in the Tibetan language, which makes it difficult for the Mongolian people to understand. And to make matters worse, the Soviets changed the old Mongolian script to the Cyrillic alphabet, further widening the language gap between Buddhism and Mongolians. Buddhism in general and 
particularly the Tibetan form of Buddhism, owes much to Mongolia because the Mongolian scholars had done so much in the past for the dev development of Buddhism in Tibet through their works. And now when situation in Mongolia is difficult, it is the responsibility of Buddhists outside to come forward and help them. Aid came from the British charity, the Tibet Foundation. Since the beginning of the revival of Buddhism in Mongolia, the Tibet Foundation has been working with the Mongolian people to rebuild their wounded tradition. One of the aims of the charity is to preserve Tibetan Buddhism, and the foundation has always thought that Mongolia is a vital ground on which Buddhism could blossom. The Tibet Foundation organizes many activities. It sends many Mongolian monks abroad for their religious education in cooperation with the Mongolian Buddhist centers and Gandan Monastery. In addition, many traditional doctors are being trained. The Tibet Foundation also cooperates with the Faculty of Tibetan Studies in the Mongolian National University. It publishes magazines and also provides scholarships for students to study in India for master's degrees in Tibetan Buddhism. Many become scholars with their help. And the way in which we worked in Mongolia is very much there to help the Buddhists who requested our help. There was absolutely no way that we were there to set an agenda, to um, dictate to Mongolians uh, how their revival would go. Right now, two big projects are underway. One is to publish a catalogue of the Buddhist works of art kept in the museums of the country. The other project that our team is working on is the publishing of textbooks to teach Buddhism and Mongolian traditional knowledge in the secondary schools of Mongolia. This is the Tibet Foundation's most ambitious project to date. These textbooks are creating a history. They're giving young Mongolians the opportunity to revive their own tradition and to meet again with the identity of Mongolia. Nothing is more important or valuable than this project. I have not known any other project more important than this since my return to Mongolia. Its value and benefit are beyond doubt. To understand what a huge step the introduction of Buddhist education into the Mongolian curriculum represents, one has to look back at the recent history of Mongolia. Recent history starts from 1911, when Mongolia became independent from the Manchu dynasty and had proclaimed the eighth bogged Javsandamba as its king, conducting both state and religious affairs. The bogged Javsandamba, or bogged Gegen, has been the Buddhist spiritual leader of Mongolians for centuries. And with independence, he became, to some extent, a comparable figure to the Dalai Lama in Tibet. His reincarnation, the ninth bogged Jabzandamba, is now living in India. Despite independence, the Chinese and the aristocratic white Russians were still fighting over Mongolia and its strategic geographical position. Sukhbatar, a young idealistic revolutionary, decided to ask the Bolsheviks in Russia for help. So in 1921, Mongolia was declared the second communist state in the world. And at that time, they lived with the clergy, with the, the, the monasteries. They collaborated with them, cooperated with them. The Bogtown was still alive. Uh, although when he passed away in 1924, slowly they began to sort of turn the screw.
And so, in the 1930s, everything relating to Buddhism came to be destroyed. Everything. More than 70,000 people were killed, the majority of whom were lamas, geshe, scholars and monks. Many lay people were also killed by the communists. This was all due to the upheaval of the time, as well as to one's karma. In autumn 1937, the Namrag monastery of my birthplace was destroyed and all the monks were killed, starting with the senior head lamas to the lowest level lamas. The killing continued throughout the winter until the spring of the following year. Temples were destroyed. Sutras and Dharma books were scattered across the ground. On the eastern side of the monastery, there were two large mountains with forested mountains stretching in front and rocky mountains looming opposite. When the sutras and prayer books were scattered, from a distance it looked like herds of moving sheep. Nobody dared to collect them. Everybody was scared at that time. Almost all the temples and Buddhist centers of Mongolia were closed down or destroyed. Only Gandan, the main monastery of the country, survived the communist purge. Lamas were encouraged and even forced to marry and to go hunting, activities which monks would have previously been prohibited from doing. Therefore, the discipline of the monks was not in accord of what it should have been due to the political pressure at that time. Before 1990, there was almost no discipline regarding maintaining monks' vows. As it was prohibited to practice any religion, people kept their beliefs to themselves and used to conduct religious rituals in secret. They kept representations of deities behind their ordinary family photographs. And only during the Tsagan Sa, the Mongolian New Year festival, would they bring them out and make offerings to them. In whatever way communist propaganda might try to influence the people, Mongolians never disowned their tradition. When the time came for the democratic movement to free themselves from the Soviet Union, the Mongolian Buddhist undercurrents re-emerged. One of them introduced Bakula Rinpoche, a Buddhist teacher from Ladakh and an Indian MP, who later played an important role in the revival of Buddhism in Mongolia. It was in 1989 that Bakula Rinpoche was appointed ambassador of India to Mongolia. And it wasn't long after he arrived that the young Democrats began to do their demonstrations and their hunger strikes in the main Sukhapata Square. And in two ways, Bakula Rinpoche tried to use the teachings of the Buddha to guide the people involved in this process. First, he, he urged the president not to turn on the strikers and the hunger strikers, not to use violence. Second, when the, the Democrats came to see him to urge his help. I was in my office and I received a telephone call from somebody I did not know. He introduced himself and he said that uh, we are people sitting on hunger strike at Sukhavata Square and that we would like to meet Rinpoche and seek his guidance. He first of all said that he couldn't take part in the revolution, he was a diplomat, 
but again, he urged them to whatever action they took to do it non-violently. And he then gave them blessing cords and um, they went back to the square and distributed the blessing cords to most of the strikers. And it was the next day that the government conceded and gave in. It was a big success. It is a great achievement that a small country like Mongolia succeeded in bringing democracy when it is situated between the two big communist countries, China and Russia. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our nation. Politicians at that time did so much to build democracy peacefully. Bat Monk, the Communist Party first secretary, and others were intelligent people, as I remember. The appropriately named Peaceful Revolution opened a new era of Buddhism in Mongolia. Throughout the country, families discovered an uncle, a father, a grandfather, who had secretly been a monk during Soviet times. The first thing to be done was to learn as much as possible from our predecessors and to re-establish the monasteries according to traditional customs. There was little time left in which to do this before they would die. Hundreds of monasteries were rebuilt based on the old monks' memories. Mongolians came to pay their respects to the new temples and to remember those monks killed during the communist purge. I became a monk in 1990 because my family wanted me to. They said that our great-grandfathers were monks, so one has to follow in their footsteps. Hidden deities and sutras, Buddhist texts, were brought back. Chanting and rituals soon began again. It was a new spring for the blue scarf of Mongolian Buddhism. So that within a very short time, maybe five years, really a lot of the ritual practices had been reinstated. And it was the education side of Buddhism, particularly from the, in the great philosophy colleges, that was really missing. But freedom brings challenges. Economically, Mongolia was battered. Russia, which had supported the country for 70 years, withdrew overnight. There was no longer any water or electricity supply, no universal health service. And the zoos, the deadly winds that can reach minus 60 degrees Celsius, hit the country one year after another, decimating the nomads' herds. Mongolia was on its knees. Buddhism in Mongolia faced a huge challenge. What to do with no resources, hardly any educated lamas, all the rituals and sacred texts written in Tibetan that very few could understand, and the threat of the arrival of new religions. However, there was indeed hope for Buddhism. And in this, uh, I would say, the visit of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 92, that was His Holiness's first visit in the post-Soviet Mongolia, and gave an impression of what people wanted. You know, thousands and thousands of people came forward, came out to listen to him, to see him. I was happy to have such an opportunity. I stayed at home and prayed from here. Before this happened, I almost believed that Buddhism would not be revived. Seeing him come to Mongolia, I remember my parents used to tell me that Buddhism would be restored in Mongolia. Following his visit to Mongolia, the Dalai Lama advised Funsok Wangyal, a founding trustee of the Tibet Foundation, to help the Mongolians in whatever way possible. 
The Tibet Foundation is a British charity established in 1985 in London, working towards creating greater awareness and the preservation of Tibetan Buddhism. The foundation was impressed by the Mongolians' efforts to revive Buddhism and concerned by the many obstacles they were facing. It was the right time to begin the Buddhism in Mongolia program. I am happy that Mongolians receive such respect from the Tibetan people and their government, especially from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It is incredible to be able to engage in such humanitarian activities despite living in an alien country themselves. When I first heard about the activities of the Tibet Foundation, I was surprised because I knew that the Tibetans themselves don't have very good living conditions. After inviting a Mongolian traditional music group and Buddhist scholars to Europe to gain support from the West, the charity focused on the most urgent need, Buddhist education in Mongolia. The decision made by the trustees was that the programme should be based on education because, as I said, it was very clear that um, there was an acute shortage of teachers. There were literally handfuls of monks who had lived through the communist years who had been educated to a level that is required in this form of Tibetan Buddhism to pass on the teachings. Almost all the lineages so important in the Buddhist transmission of teachings had been broken during the communist time. Mongolia faced being disconnected from the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings and tradition. As with everything to do with Buddhism, um, teachings and, and vows, all of these traditions have to be traceable directly back to the Buddha himself. So there has to be an unbroken lineage. As the Dharma has been preserved in the exiled Tibetan Buddhist institutions in India, His Holiness the Dalai Lama made a proposal to the Mongolians to send young Mongolian monks to be educated in India and to send Tibetan monk teachers to Mongolia. This offer was accepted by the Mongolian authorities and supported by the Tibet Foundation. Mongolia and Tibet are two separate countries, but spiritually and culturally, the people are disciples of one Lama, the same master. Gandan Monastery. Monks from Gandan were the first Mongolians to study in Tibetan institutes in India. They came from the Buddhist University, now called Zanabazar University, which opened in Gandan in the 70s. They were the only link between the old Buddhist scholars who had not been killed by the Soviets and the very young generation who expressed an interest in Buddhism. Returning from India, having received a complete education, the Gandan monks would lead the revival of Buddhism in Mongolia. Those trained pioneers who went to India first had already arrived back and began working as teachers or helping in the administration. They also became important in Gandan Monastery in terms of developing the Dharma. Following the success of this initiative, monks from Mongolia and also from the Russian Federation have continued to be sent to India with the support of the Tibet Foundation. In order to receive the title of Geshe, the Buddhist post-doctorate qualification, a thorough education can last as long as 15 years. At the beginning, we didn't understand the language. Now, after two years, we understand Tibetan and also some Indian language. When I got here first, the climate was hard for me. It was too hot. I had difficulties with the food too. Now we're learning about the meaning of the sutras, offerings and chantings. As for myself, I've had a strong faith and interest in Buddhism since childhood. So I started my studies and learned to recite prayers. 
But I realized that I hardly knew the meaning of the prayers. I had only heard about the three vehicles, but barely knew what they meant. So I had a strong desire to understand my religion in depth. When I asked my teacher for guidance, he told me that I had to study Buddhist dialectics. Since there are no institutional facilities in my homeland, I came here mainly to study Buddhist dialectics. And then after a thorough study, they should go back uh, to Mongolia and then um, uh, re-establish the uh, tradition of uh, teaching and study, not only the rituals, the teaching and study, particularly study through debate system, like uh, in the <coughs> Tibet monasteries. That can only give them a rational understanding of Buddhism. One of the challenges faced by monks in Mongolia is keeping their vows. As part of the heritage of the communist rule, some of the older monks and also younger ones are still married or continue to drink alcohol. A monk or a nun, compared to a layperson, they've done two things. One is they have renounced their worldly life, they've left their, their home and they've gone to live with a, a community of monks or nuns. The other thing they've done is they've taken vows. A Buddhist monk can take more than 200 vows. These are all related to the five basic precepts of Buddhism. The five basic precepts, as they're called, are to avoid killing, avoid stealing, avoid lying, avoid what's termed sexual misconduct, and avoid al alcohol specifically, or um, intoxicants, things which are going to cloud the mind. I think the approach that His Holiness is adopting is that let those older generations who have, under unavoidable circumstances, were not able to keep their vows fully, but consider themselves to be part of the Sangha, let them continue as they have done in the past in some of the existing monasteries. But in some new monasteries or groups that are coming up, as far as possible, His Holiness is, uh, I think, trying to encourage them to uh, adopt the Tibetan tradition of keeping the full and uh, complete vows of the monks. Choosing between a monastic life or being a lay Buddhist also applies to women. Traditionally, there hasn't been a nunnery as such in Mongolia, but there were gatherings of women practitioners who performed chanting, puja and blessing rituals. It can be seen at any monastery that most of its pilgrims are women of all different ages who show respect to lamas and ensure their children's destiny. They are the ones who kept their beliefs to themselves during the difficult time when the state was antagonistic to Buddhism. They passed on their faith to the next generation. After the 1990s, when religion was open to everybody, we started receiving requests from women to study Buddhism at our university. As our university didn't have classes open to female students, we had to turn them down. Later, with the support of the Tibet Foundation, we were able to offer admission to women, and that group has already graduated from our school. Initiating BA courses in Buddhism, funding Buddhist women's centers, sending Mongolian women to Tibetan nunneries, or to study traditional medicine in India, the Tibet Foundation has always tried to give women the same access as men to higher Buddhist education. We now conduct prayers every day in our center. We own this piece of land 
which is in the heart of the city of Ulaanbaatar. Our center is well known now. We are extending our activities to the public to spread Buddhism and accumulate merit for the well-being of all sentient beings. We also cooperate with other monasteries and religious organizations. I think uh, the Tibetan nuns and Buddhist nuns in general are going through a very exciting time in history because there are so many opportunities brought forward to them. They're all studying, they're debating, they're meditating. You know, they're doing so many things that uh, some of them never did before. The rich Buddhist tradition of Mongolia is now being revived in many disciplines, philosophy, art and medicine. This has led the Tibet Foundation to broaden its range of projects. Buddhist and Tibetan language scholars have been invited to teach in Mongolian monasteries and universities. Mongolian Buddhist texts, most of them in Tibetan, have begun to be translated into modern Mongolian. I understand there are many great sutras in the Tibetan language, but I don't know Tibetan. My son bought me some books on Buddhism in Mongolian, and I hope these will help me to understand. <laughs> The Tibet Foundation also helped with the renovation of the library in Zanabazar Buddhist University in Gandan Monastery. At Petub Monastery, built by Bakula Rinpoche in Ulaanbaatar, they've supported the monks' education and funded a clinic for traditional medicine. Some people call it Tibetan medicine. Some call it Mongolian traditional medicine. According to what my teachers told me, this is Buddhist medical knowledge. The sutra called Four Basics of Medicine is based on the Buddha's teachings. The main distinguishing feature of Tibetan medicine is that it not only treats physical illness, but also, due to Buddhist influence, it relieves one from mental inner problems and has the potential to provide inner happiness. Together with medicine, Buddhist art is also a valuable heritage of Mongolia. Zana Bazar, for example, the first Bogd Gegen, the first spiritual leader of Mongolia, was also one of its greatest artists. Unfortunately, most of his pure, beautiful sculptures were not destroyed by the Soviets, unlike a huge number of Buddhist artifacts and other sacred items. To reintroduce education in Buddhist art, the Mongolian Institute of Buddhist Art was created in Gandan Monastery. The Ministry of Education then asked the Tibet Foundation to help catalogue for the first time the Buddhist art that remains in the country's five major museums. Initiated by the late director of the Cultural Heritage Centre, this project will enable the Mongolians and the world to know about this precious tradition, whilst preventing the possibility of further artefacts being smuggled out of the country. Within this framework, we have catalogued more than 5,000 pieces housed in the five museums here, including tankers. Now we are going to include many precious art pieces that have been kept in storage in other museums for many years. Over 15 years, Mongolia has changed a lot, moving from communism to capitalism, from nomadic to settled life. Whilst Mongolian society is facing many issues, 
Buddhism is blossoming in the monasteries, but not really outside. Young Mongolians prefer to adopt Western civilization without knowing about their own culture. <laughs> As the morality and ethics of today's youth is continually degenerating, we should use Mongolian traditional knowledge and religion to restore them. But how to do this is an important question. You know, the world is changing, globalizations. And uh, today, Buddhism could survive in Mongolia because today's world requires peaceful security. In developed countries, their education system focuses on providing a good upbringing, not just giving mathematical knowledge. This is based on studying traditions and customs. As Mongolians have a nomadic culture, we have different traditions, not settled civilizations. We have to preserve that unique culture and shape our own distinct model to develop our country based on that difference. It was um, clear that there was no real material for school children. We produced a small amount of stories and we produced a video that we'd had translated from English into Mongolian. But we knew that, that it, if the Buddhist teachings could be taught as part of a cultural historical reference in Mongolia, that it would have quite an important impact. It was during a meeting between Funsok Wangyal and the Vice Minister of Education that the idea arose, an idea that would prove to be crucial for the future of Mongolia. We approached the Tibet Foundation to help us in publishing books which will contribute to the education of our younger generation. The main goal of this publication would be to teach traditional Mongolian knowledge and customs to our children. The publication consists of three volumes. The first one for elementary school children, the second for middle school children, and the third volume for high school students. They are to be included in the revised school curriculum under a subject called civic education. I'd like to note here two specific aspects of this project. First, this is the foremost project to teach Buddhism in depth in ordinary schools, not in religious universities. We, the writers, have contributed our best to this project, and the Tibet Foundation helped us enormously to achieve this goal. Secondly, implementation of this project will cover the whole country and help the Mongolia younger generation to gain a systematic knowledge of Buddhism. This is a great contribution from the Tibet Foundation towards the education of Mongolians. I felt that it is the same kind of activities. The Sakyabas brought the Buddhist teachings to Mongolia, and so now you are continuing this by uh, inventing the Buddhist textbooks, which will be a like the seed for the future uh, generations in preserving the Buddhist teachings. These books are written by well-known Mongolian scholars who have put a lot of effort into them. 
The challenge faced by these people was how to make the religious teachings easily understandable to children. Our first draft was translated and shown to Tibetan scholars who gave us valuable advice, especially Professor Denzin. After spending many months on the second draft, we showed it to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This was an important step. The work you have done is important and very valuable. Tibetans are in a difficult position at the moment. You Mongolians are free and you have a great responsibility to carry the work further. We are not saying that students should believe or practice Buddhism. But it is very important that they should be given the opportunity to learn their own tradition and be part of that spiritual history that they could be very proud of. Autumn 2007, Ulaanbaatar. The textbooks have been completed and are ready for distribution. For one year, they'll be on trial in the secondary schools of Mongolia before a final review takes place. I hope that this new subject will give our children the knowledge and understanding of how to respect their elders how to love family and friends, how to treat nature and the environment, how to love one's country, and so on. These are the main subjects and aim of the publication. You know, if, we didn't, if we'd never done anything else in Mongolia, that is really, will be our greatest legacy, I'm quite convinced. Mongolia, as a country, has been connected with Buddhism throughout its history. The Mongolian tradition to care for nature is also closely related with Buddhist traditions and customs. From generation to generation, our forefathers passed down to us the religious tradition to worship nature as Mother Earth and Father Sky, and to pray to and protect waters and mountains. The Buddha actually predicts in the text, known as 800,000 verses, that the Dharma will remain in the world for a period of 5,000 years. 2,500 years have already passed. Therefore, it is not yet the time for the Dharma to degenerate. From a very fragile base in 1990, the people of Mongolia have taken the first step to re-establish Buddhism in Mongolia. However, they still have big challenges ahead. Hope is in the hands of the younger generation. If they take over the transmission from the old people, it will be up to them to preserve and extend the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, throughout Mongolia. Yeah, 
The Buddha said, the basis of all suffering is a person's own mind. If one can meditate to control one's negative thoughts and train the mind, then one can find peace. That is how I find peace. In Mongolia, offering a blue scarf, a blue kata, is the Buddhist way of welcoming and blessing someone. There are five colors in the Tibetan Buddhist flag. Some say that the white color in the flag refers to Avalokiteshvara, the patron deity of Tibet. A kata in Tibet is traditionally white. Another color in the flag is yellow, referring to Manjushri, the patron deity of China. A Chinese kata is yellow. And another is blue, referring to the patron deity of Mongolia, Vajrapani. Mongolians offer a blue scarf. <laughs> <laughs> 